Most Web3 projects predominantly DeFi related require the end user such as yourself and me to have some sort of virtual identity attached to an address that distinguishes potentially malicious users from those who are, for example, exceptionally behaved. Now, the list for why this is important does kind of span equally as far as the possibilities that Web3 can take us from things like lowering the rates that you can find in over collateralized lending pools or simply that allows the users to hold a higher trust rating in a governance model. Either way, the model for how dApps currently gain user credit ratings or just information in general is through the use of centralized and even unprivate KYC methods like the ones we see that banks currently adopt or they actually implement what's called a DID or a decentralized identity method, which collects information on the user the more they use an application and then store this on the blockchain under a unique address. Now, this does seem the way that most decentralized applications or even protocols have been going down and that's because it actually works. The only issue, and there is a pretty big one, is that they are all coded differently they all gain user information differently and the information is application static, meaning that it is not transferable to other applications. Now to put it in perspective, just imagine if you had to store hundreds of different types of identification documents as each bank or credit facility required something different from you. And better yet, they never even communicated. No, as you can pretty much imagine the process would be pretty annoying and you would have to continue to supply documents and do that single process over and over again. I think it's pretty safe to say you'd go kind of crazy. But more importantly, this is not scalable guys and it's something that needs to be solved. Now I wanna supply you with a great example you've probably not even thought of. So let's just put it in perspective. If say a group of people or just an individual held say 100 unique addresses in a small crypto project, under a governance model. Now, if this individual or group were to be able to maintain enough of a majority to sway decisions in their favor, this could obviously be quite catastrophic for the small growing network. So part of Latentry's job is to aggregate these addresses so the project knows that one entity or person has direct control over these addresses and then obviously therefore can prevent any malicious activity. So in comes Latentry, a cross-chain decentralized identity aggregator built on Substrate that does exactly as the name suggests. It aggregates user addresses across different blockchains and off-chain applications as well as services and then forms one identity that is accepted by the entire ecosystem. Pretty cool. Now, this obviously has more than one sort of application method and user experiences, but more importantly, it does actually help applications identify who is using their platform, how many unique addresses they hold, and then obviously that they can be trusted. Now, I know you're probably thinking, how does this actually know who you are and what addresses you actually maintain? Well, that is actually a very, very good question. And without going into the technicals, essentially the user is to collate all cross-chain accounts in the Latentry Runtime app, where a unique Latentry identity is created. And after the accounts are actually linked, the user can then trigger an asset claim, which will then begin the query into the assets and accounts held with the on-chain proofs that have been generated. Now, once this is actually verified and complete, the user may operate DeFi applications and other dApps using the unique Latentry identifier, where all of the data accumulated across each and every single account and even address is stored, all completely decentralized. Now, this is only one of the many applications Latentry has so far shared with an app and further verification methods also in the pipeline, which is really, really good to see. Now, these additional applications will work together to create a fully secure and safe portfolio of sorts that will unlock various features across DeFi and other decentralized applications, obviously depending on their KYC requirements. Now, Latentry actually falls into that nice little niche I like to look for because the space desperately needs a one-stop shop for identity verification. Now, this will obviously not only help the space or many, many projects, but it will also help validate the ecosystem to the mass market. Now, 
This, of course, hits all three of my nails on the head that I personally like to look for in promising projects, and that's applying to the mass market, uh, cross-chain capable, which is obviously very, very important, and fitting into its own unique niche. Well, welcome back to a new video, everyone. My name's Kyron from No BS Crypto, and if you are new around here, I would like to say welcome, and if you are a returning subscriber, I would like to thank you again for watching a brand new video. So guys, today, of course, we're discussing Latentry, and from here, we're gonna break it down a little bit more fundamentally, just skim over some of the things that you should personally be looking for within any sort of project, but again, I'll be outlining them and giving you my personal opinion on Latentry, and concluding that, I'm gonna give you my personal, dead set, honest, brutal truth at the end of the video. So stay tuned for that, and let's get into the video. All right, everyone, I welcome you to my computer. A little bit of a change, but I do want to apologize for the downloading. I plan to get a ring light soon. So regardless, let's get into Latentry's fundamental breakdown. So very briefly, let's have a look at the listing here on CoinMarketCap. So as we're able to tell, it's a very, very small project. Matter of fact, I'd probably consider it on borderline micro cap. So very, very early stage of the project. However, as we can see recently, we have had just over a 10% pump, which is crazy, but more importantly, we've had a 69% jump in the trading volume, which is crazy. So that leads me to believe something important has happened recently. And initially I thought, well, hang on, maybe they secured a spot as a parachain, but matter of fact, if we come over here, we can actually see that they did not secure a spot as a parachain. Matter of fact, they got refunded. So anyone that did participate in this particular round has been refunded. That was auctions between six to 11. So the upcoming auctions are coming up. So I do expect uh, Latentry to actually be a participant in the next round as well, where they should probably secure a spot. I would say so. I mean, they're a solid project as we discussed earlier, and I do think that um, people should get around them for the next slots. Either way, we do have a lot of parachain slots available. So at some point in time, they will. But nevertheless, that wasn't the reason for the pump. But Let's just go over some of the more broad and basic terms so that anyone new to the space can understand. So first of all, Latentry, the ticker is lit. I do like the logo. People criticize me and say logo isn't important. I believe it's important as well as a name. You don't wanna have a shitty project name. You just won't see it in the top 10, 20 projects. But, but either way, so as we can see here, uh, market cap, so $57 million, as I mentioned to you before, micro cap with a recent pump in the trading volume as well. Diluted market cap's not really important, but what is important is the circulating supply and the max slash total supply, which is very, very critical in a project because if obviously the max supply is ridiculous in the multi, multi billions or trillions, it's not really a great look unless they have unless they have a, a deflationary uh, aspect involved or, or a sort of a burn feature in place. Um, now we can see the circulating supply here is 34 million lit tokens, and we're just going to uh, sort of cross check that with uh, the token distribution investing schedule in a second. So it all kind of equals out. But as we can see, Coin Market Cap have generously given us a percentage, so 35% more or less which obviously that's pretty easy maths to do anyway, um, is currently in circulating supply and more will become available once the parachain sort of auctions are over and they have guaranteed a spot. So with that being said, let's actually have a look at uh, what I just mentioned to you before. So the vesting schedule and the token distribution. So as we can see here, uh, the tokens that are actually, well, the entire distribution is split into the following percentages. So 15% is to the Latentry team, 8% went to seed investors. What do I think of that? Honestly, 15% going to the team isn't too bad, and I really do like that 8% is only going to the seed investors, pretty much. You find in a lot of the projects nowadays, they're looking at around about 12 to 20% going to early investors, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. That is a large chunk of any sort of token uh, distribution. So the fact that it's only 8% is obviously a good thing. Lower the better, but in saying that, as we can see by the next stop point, 12% is actually going to the private sale and further sales. So again, this kind of equals out to about 20%. So as I mentioned to you before, it does pull to the high side. Um, seed investors will genuinely get a cheaper price of the token, so they're more inclined to sell once they do have the uh, available tokens. Uh, and, and obviously it's still private sale and, and you know, further sales from there, they are going to be still be getting a cheap price for the token no matter what. But nevertheless, there's a, there's certain, uh, for these venture firms, for these big um, capitalists, they, they, too, they tend to look for 
a certain amount of uh, return. So like, like let's just say a 10x and they won't typically sell out unless they achieve that 10x or sort of a, uh, you know, they, they think of every sort of solution or every situation. So they're not going to be like, oh, well, we'll pull out at a 2x. Obviously, a 2x is still pretty good when you're talking about a few hundred thousand dollars. But a lot of the time, if they're investing, they, they do tend to wait for a larger sort of multiplier. So that isn't too bad. 20% is total combined on the higher side. But if we're breaking it down, 12% and 8% respectively isn't too bad. Now, 17% will be reserved for the foundation to be used as grants. That's fantastic. That's fine. Grants obviously help the ecosystem bring more developers in to build more applications on that underlying blockchain. Also, it does help... Um, you know, with, with different sort of economic um, incentives as well for the, for the entire ecosystem. They're not going to be giving out any sort of grants and using that 17% for any sort of horrible idea. So, of course, it will also further the advance in, uh, you know, cross-chain or aggregate sort of identity um, decentralized methods as well. Now, 3% to the Binance launch pool, which um, it's it was just one of the, <laughs> well, it's a Binance launch pool. It's, it's not too bad. It's um, it's been there, done that, and as we're going to see in a second with the vesting schedule, it's just it's just been constantly open and released, so it's not too bad. Three percent isn't too much. Now, a full forty point five percent will remain as network incentives in parachain auction system. So uh, that obviously, uh, if we're going back to have a look at the thirty five percent currently in circulation, so we've got another forty or so percent to tack on top of that once the once the parachain sort of. Uh, auction has been secured and obviously this will be released over time but nevertheless that does leave us with a very very small amount for the seed investors and whatnot so it all kind of makes a lot of sense and i do and as i mentioned actually here yeah uh, they do think it's reasonably fair of course they're going to say that obviously any sort of project is going to back itself but i do agree with them and it isn't too bad and i do think it is reasonably fair so that being said, the more important thing I would dare to say is the vesting schedule. So you can have, let's, you could probably even hypothetically have 99% of the tokens given to seed round investors. But if that's distributed distributed to them over a hundred years, I mean, it equals out kind of okay in that sort of circumstance. So this is very, very important to have a look at the vesting schedule. So let's uh, let's kind of break it down a little bit here. So as I said to you before, the Binance, let's actually maximize it. So the Binance launch pool, as I said to you before, constantly available, they, did, they didn't have that on a, on a sort of vesting period. And, and then we have the seed sale here in purple. So as we can see here, over the course until about mid 2020, uh, start of 2022, They've got um, them on a, on a linear release, and then from there, it's all accessed. Uh, so then we have this strategic sale, more or less the same. Moving forward, everything is pretty well the same. However, notice the parachain auction and ecosystem does commence about the start of 2022. So um, anyone that does participate in the crowd loan, and obviously, given that they do secure a spot soon, will be releasing over the course of maybe three, four, five years. As we can see here, this only goes up to August 2025. So obviously from there, it does increase. And this is 60% uh, of, the, of, the, of the release, okay? So as you can see at the top left here, there's only 60% and not 100%, okay? Which does kind of fall in line with what they currently have uh, in circulation here. So, so it all equals out. So I hope that kind of makes a little bit of sense. So more or less, what is my opinion on this? As I said to you before, pretty much more or less uh, continuing from my my personal opinion on the distribution. I do think it, it is quite fair, to be honest with you. There's no, no real um, room for concern here. Although I must say the strategic sale and the seed guys, they do have access, at least what this is telling me, to all of their tokens, at least at this point in time, I'm recording this pretty much the 1st of April. So um, if I was anyone looking to invest in Latentry, I would just tread with a little bit of caution knowing that these guys can particularly dump their tokens at any given time. Now, just remember that even though it is a combined total of 20%, we need to remember this is distributed across multiple entities, okay? This isn't just given out to every single, so this isn't just uh, sort of individual entities. So no, no one party's having 20%, it's distributed. And that's, that leads us to where we are here. So partners and investors. Now, this is only a few of them. There are, obviously are a few more that haven't been updated yet, but more or less, I wanna start with the investors. So as we can see here, there's about, what's that? Three by, so that's about 15 
uh, investors as we can see here. So that 20% is obviously divided by 15, more or less. Some will have more, some will have less than, than, than the uh, division between of that. But more or less, it's it's we can just safely say that. So there are some pretty big names here. I want to start off with FBG Capital. These guys are huge. Also, Hypersphere are getting more and more attention, at least for me. NGC are pretty big. Divergence are somewhat pretty big. And DFG are a strong um investment company as well so um, there, there are a few more here that i'd like to list off but more or less they're sort of the main ones i have my eyes on but it does it does lead me to believe that this is a strong project and also as we can tell but on the top of the website here they do have a web3 grant um wherever that went web3 foundation grants program so th these guys are th these guys aren't a joke that they're, they're serious they're, they're a good project they've been vetted by the web3 foundation obviously that to, to become a power chain you have to be somewhat legitimate or you know be vetted to be legitimate so uh, obviously polkadot deems them to be trustworthy and therefore so do i okay so uh more or less if, if you're thinking about investing in latentry i would just uh i would tread with caution on the fact that I would expect uh, the token to be somewhat dumped uh, come the next sort of, I guess you could say bull rush or, or market uh, increase. And we're seeing that right now with Bitcoin kind of treading towards or over uh, $47,000. So uh, be cautioned, but also I would expect Latentry to go well and truly above the 500 million market cap level um, once it does secure a parachain slot. And look guys, honestly, if, if you're a long player in the space, and you're planning to be here like myself for the next decade, two, three, four decades. Honestly, investing in a project like this that is sort of one of the leading uh, developers in this uh, aggregated identity space, I would I would be fair to say that you know investing in them wouldn't be a bad idea at all. And as we can see from the partners here, they do have an extensive partner list. Of course, a lot of these partners are uh, parachains themselves, uh, which is fine because obviously this is creating an ecosystem within Polkadot. And also then you have the alternatives like Moonbeam as well, which will give that EVM compatible sort of option as well. So, I mean, look, these guys are these guys are making moves and they're constantly adapting to to what's happening at the moment it's just a shame that they haven't secured a parachain slot yet but that completely depends on the the community uh seeing what we're seeing here and that's what i want to point out to you guys okay so again i want to give you my uh, honest opinion at the end of the video but that's more or less what, what's happening now i want to just end the this fundamental analysis on the socials here so more particularly the twitter which is sort of the main um gravitational pull that at least i find when it comes to investigating a particular project's social following that's pretty much because twitter is kind of like the hub of any sort of project and more particularly it's the hub of the entire cryptocurrency community most people gravitate towards twitter for the news and updates so having a strong following on here is crucial because if you don't when you post news updates any sort of particular roadmap events that have come up or partnerships you need people to be able to uh, obviously uh, know that it's actually happening for lack of a better word and so obviously having a strong following is important so they have 68,000 followers on twitter which is quite good actually i'm not going to lie to you for a market cap of only you know 60 million it is quite good to have a strong following like that so fantastic news to see that and uh, but more importantly we need to check engagement so they could have 200,000 followers, but their engagement might only be a few hundred likes or retweets, whatever it may be. So if we just scroll down, this is what I'll recommend you guys to do. If you go ahead and have a look at the likes, retweets and comments on more or less, I'd say the last few months, um, you'll be able to see sort of their engagement. Now there is uh, sort of applications we can go and use that I'd mentioned in my, in my Hidden Gem course, my paid course. Uh, which can actually extrapolate this data for us and also give us a lot more information. So this is only a little bit, but more or less for a free version, um, I would suggest going through and just having a look at this. So I mean, again, 68,000 followers or whatever it may be, they're only really receiving you know, 50, 60, 70 likes a post, sometimes even less. So I mean, and the engagement aspect isn't all there, but that we've got to remember guys, like crypto is in a bit of a slump at the moment. So I mean, there's lots of variables at play more than just what meets the eye. So given my personal opinion on the Twitter, I would honestly say if I was gonna rate it, I'd probably have to give it maybe a five or a six out of 10. Again, that engagement is a bit of a hard hitter and I will crucify them for that, even if the, even if the space is in a bit of a slump at the moment, because I know other projects 
are still receiving quite a few, uh, quite a bit of attention. So again, it all sort of falls back on the parachain slots, in my opinion. If they secure a spot, there's going to be more news about it. They're going to be able to integrate with a lot of different projects. And when they do integrate with other projects, the other projects will then post it on their Twitter. It's just a never-ending perpetual cycle. So uh, let's now move into my overall opinion. So for those of you who are here just for my rating, I'm going to give that to you, but I suggest you stay through right to where I actually explain why I've given it the rating I have, because obviously that's pretty important. Now, out of 10, it'd have to be a six and a half to a seven. And the reason being is because I know Latentry is a strong foundational project. And that's pretty much because Latentry has recently been listed on Binance. And to be listed on Binance, there's some pretty rigorous... Uh, vetting that they actually do. They don't just list any sort of project if they think it's gonna be a rug pull or potentially malicious. So that gives me more confidence in Latentry. Moreover, they actually to even become or to have the opportunity to become a parachain on Polkadot, again, rigorous vetting. So this gives me a strong, you could say, consensus layer, a strong foundation as to think that Latentry is a solid project, or at least they believe it, it could potentially be a solid project at least in the security side of things, but that's only a small fraction of the problem. The main thing and the main reason you're here is to find how many multipliers you can get. Of course, we all rule, rule in crypto for the decentralized aspect for the, you know changing the world, and that's the reason why I get up in the morning and want to research, but at the same time, we're also here to make money, and let's not lie about that. So um, Again, Latentry has the opportunity to gain the multipliers because right now it's only about 57 million market cap, which is only very, very small. And I know market cap shouldn't be an indication of potential multipliers, but it gives us a good groundwork for such. So again, I do believe Latentry can well and truly go above a 500 million market cap in the next few years. And that obviously is a, is a 10X from here. So we have the room to grow and, and I do believe Latentry will. It just depends on how quickly and how many partnerships they go out and obtain. And obviously depending on the, the Polkadot sort of integration as well. So uh, there are a lot of different projects in the space at the moment trying to ascertain this sort of issue. And Latentry is one of them. The key differential is that Latentry is obviously going to be trying to be a parachain on Polkadot, which will open it up to a plethora of sort of partnerships, which is fantastic. Plus they actually currently have an address they have a smart contract uh, on Ethereum. So again, they're they're sort of applying themselves to the main two ecosystems, I believe will always be in the space once Ethereum does uh, switch over to ETH2 and become a modular blockchain. You, I think what we'll find, and this is, a, this is gonna be a very, very controversial opinion, is that a lot of the top 10, 20, even top 100 uh, blockchains that are currently out there, we'll find that they'll have to change from this monolithic design to a modular design. And for those of you who don't understand what that means, I'm making a video on that soon. And it's gonna be a very difficult and time consuming process, which if they can't adapt quick enough, they will inevitably, and this is particularly for the, uh, the blockchains that do sort of move towards the execution side of the trilemma, uh, they're gonna to move to Ethereum as a roll up. And, and I do believe a lot of projects will move towards that because a lot of the new blo uh, blockchains like Solana, for example, Binance Smart Chain, these guys cater towards fast and cheap transactions, which obviously takes away from the decentral decentralized and scalability aspects of a blockchain. I'm getting a bit off topic now, but more or less what I'm trying to say to bring it back to the topic is that Latentry is building on two of the biggest ecosystems I, I personally believe will always be in the space, Polkadot and Ethereum. Now, that all depends obviously if they do secure a slot as an uh, as a parachain, sorry, but I believe in due time, they will. Okay, we have 100 slots to fill. Right now, we're only at like number 12, okay, or number 15 or something like that. So either way, guys, I hope that gives you some sort of an idea of what my thought process is. Again, the Twitter does kind of bring it down. The followers are great. The engagement is not, unfortunately, but again, we could probably attribute some of that to the current market status. And also the partnerships are there. So they are partnering with a lot of, great projects, a lot of big projects, which is fantastic. And they do have a solid list of investors to support them through a bear market, okay? So uh, again, six and a half, seven out of 10, nothing wrong with them. We'll see what the future holds and we'll see how much of the market share they can pull uh, in terms of this identity aggregation sort of aspect. 
I do apologize, guys. My camera has unfortunately died, but I just want to leave you with this. Like, I honestly do think Latentry has great potential, as I've already mentioned to you, but there are some fundamental issues, I guess you could say, that could, could come up in the future and I could see would stunt Latentry's growth. Now, obviously, these guys are fully immersed in this particular space, so they would obviously be searching towards finding a solution towards these matters. But I guess the most prominent sort of issue, in my opinion, would be emphasizing the use of using Latentry and actually aggregating your identities. You know, what may um, be the incentive to do so? I think what they're doing right now is they're actually using their token as an incentive uh, for this. But I think the main sort of ingredient here would be the use of these, these applications actually saying, okay, look, um, you can use Latentry or any sort of other aggregate identity sort of um, application to use what we're doing here in the DeFi setting or whatever it may be. Uh, otherwise, you can't use your application, okay? That would make sense to me. But then again, that is also kind of moving towards centralization because then you have to somewhat use a particular application like Latentry to then store all your information in that. But this is a very, very sensitive topic because you know what what do you classify as centralized? Because if, if Latentry is decentralized, which is what they're planning to be, then, then technically it's not, but technically it creates a bottleneck. So we've got this catch-22 in this sort of ever-evolving, I wouldn't even say ever-evolving, but this constant cycle of what is and what if. And I guess I just need to stress that to you, to you um, because this is what I'm thinking. So essentially to, to just you know put it back down on the table again and, and you know unfold all the, all the cards, I would say they need to create an, an intrinsic sort of mechanism that, well, this is not just Latentry, this is the other applications as well, that sort of enables people to want to use Latentry. Otherwise, what is the point? No one's going to want to use it. Of course, you can have incentives being the token itself, being Latentry, being the lit token, but you also need the other applications to say, hey, if you want to use us, if you want to use the application, what we have you must verify you're a legitimate person through the Latentry app. And that's just my only my only sort of concern with it is the adoption side of things. So I wanted to point that out before I quickly ended the video, just in case anyone else was thinking the same thing. So with that being said, guys, thank you so much for listening and I will see you in the next video. Bye.